How's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Anthony Messerly. Um, I'm a principal engineer at uh, Rackspace, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, stateless hypervisors at scale. So a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Rackspace almost 14 years. Um, I originally started out heading out hardware development for Rackspace, um, and then I transitioned over to work on the, the initial cloud servers product offering. Um, we acquired Slicehost, so I kind of transitioned over to that uh, full time. Uh, and then that eventually became um, working on heading up the engineering team that launched the, uh, the next gen OpenStack public cloud. Um, some of my passions are just R&D and prototyping out new products and just kind of playing around with things in general. A little bit about Rackspace. Um, we've been, our OpenStack public cloud has been in production since uh, August of 2012. Um, we have six regions across, across the world. Um, we have tens of thousands of hypervisors and over 10 different platforms uh, or hardware platforms. Uh, and primarily, we utilize Citrix Zen Server on our virtualization product today. So let's let's talk a little bit about traditional hypervisors and kind of what they're about. Um, if you think about the components of a hypervisor in OpenStack, um, they typically run as bare metal. They have an operating system. You run some sort of configuration management on there. Um, you, you run a Nova compute, of course. And then when you talk about the instances, there's usually the, the settings and the, the virtual disks on there. And the, the mission of a hypervisor, it needs to be stable, it needs to be secure, uh, it needs to provision and run instances reliably, uh, and it also needs to be consistent with other servers. Uh, if you're running code against uh, servers, you, you want to make sure that they're kind of predictable and kind of look the same. So some of the problems we had with hypervisors at scale, um, we, had multiple op mul we have multiple versions of Zen Server. Uh, we launched in 2012, so over time, new versions came out. Um, a lot of new uh, performance optimizations and enhancements. Uh, so with that comes with a lot of different patch sets, a lot of different security fixes, uh, you know, a lot of kernels and hyper Zen hypervisors that need to be kind of patched. Um, there was a lot of Zen vulnerabilities the last few years, so um, the more versions you have, the more versions of that you have to patch. Uh, so the, the point is, the more variations, the more work. Uh, and then when you talk about server hardware, uh, you have the incorrect BIO settings and firmware that come from the factory sometimes. Um, you know, old servers have been running for a while, they've never gotten the updates, but new servers do, so um, there's a lot of inconsistency there. And then when you think about operational issues, uh, a lot of OpenStack and uh, hypervisor bugs can kind of leave things in an undesirable state um, just because there's constant bugs over time. So how we solve some of these problems? Um, we built a provisioning system that uses IPixy uh, within the BIOS and then uses Ansible within the utility disk to uh, kind of do like a factory style provisioning process. So every server that comes through or any server we reprovision goes through this process to kind of get, make sure that the, the firmware and the BIOS is all up to date. Um, then we consolidated hypervisor versions uh, just to kind of try to reduce the number of variations. Um, and we used live migrate on the ones we could to move instances off and then we would refresh that host and add it back to the, the pool. Um, we also automated a lot of oper uh, operational tasks on the hypervisors to try to reduce inconsistencies. Um, if you see a hypervisor in a weird state and there's something that's not right, we try to resolve it. Um, it's actually, the tool's actually called Resolver. Um, and if we can't, then we manually intervene. Um, but ultimately, we still have the issue where we're kind of running a traditional operating style system. Operating system. Um, you have to install it to the machine. You have to update packages. So some, our goals were to, with this project, were to try to rapidly deploy hypervisors. Um, we wanted to take advantage of every single server reboot that happened, uh, either from a maintenance, a hardware failure, uh, to try to bring the system up to the latest spec. Um, the, these systems usually longer, run a long time without a reboot, so it, it's kind of imperative to kind of take that opportunity to kind of bring them up to date when you can. Um, we wanted to have a reproducible image of our build that we could pass around to developers, engineers, um, and quality engineering, just so that they could work on what exactly is in production. Um, and we also just want to ensure consistency on the hardware platform and the operating system. So these are, these are cattle, not pets. They have one goal in life, and that's just to run instances. So we want to kind of treat them that way. So the concept is live booted hypervisors. So if you're not familiar with a live OS, uh, it's a bootable image that runs in system memory. Uh, and the image you always boot is, is usually predictable and uh, portable. And lots of OS distributions kind of use this today for um, you know, installation or rescue. Um, and you usually boot them from a CD network, USB key, and so on. Uh, and it lets you kind of boot an operating system, kind of look around, kind of use you know, some functionality without actually modifying the, the running state of the system. So what if we applied the same concept to run our, our hypervisors? 
So as Bill O'Reilly would say, we'll do it live. Um, we use a stateless live OS of our hypervisor that boots from the network to try to promote consistency across the board. Everything boots that same image, so everything's consistent. Um, and we're using Ansible to, to build that operating system image from scratch. So every time a commit gets checked in, um, it kicks off our CI CD process that runs the, the, the build process through to generate an image and then spits it out to our deployment server. Um, we're, this lets us separate the operating system from the actual uh, customer data and like basic configuration on the server. So we, we basically take the, the thing that every server has and kind of separate it, put it off to the side, and then just the uniqueness of the server along with the, the customer data, that's all kind of separated. Um, and updating the, to the latest image is done by either rebooting or doing a K exec. Um, and you can also catch up the image while it's online by just by adding packages and then adding those pack, updated packages to your image. So the next reboot will get it. So where does the persistent data go if it's a stateless image? Um, you can still tell the image where to look for its data. Um, what we did was we created a systemd unit file early on in the process, um, which mounts the local disk, and then it creates symlinks uh, to the local disk from that. Uh, so as services fire up, they look for the location that you symlinked, and it, it redirects it to the persistent store. So in this case, like you have um, your second partition is mounted to slash data. So the script would just generate a var lib nova symlink to data var lib nova. Uh, so then you can create a symlink for every directory you want. Um, usually there's not a whole lot of directories you need to symlink out. Um, you know, some common ones are Etsy Nova, um, your networking configurations, and just maybe some logging if you don't want to, you know, you can either send your logging to a syslog server or you can persist it to that local store. So how is this possible? Um, we're leveraging the Draca project. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. Um, it runs in the NitRamFS during boot, uh, and its main goal is to transition to the real root file system. Uh, it's got a lot of functionality for, for retrieving the rootFS over the network uh, with HTTP, FTP. Um, we recently added torrent support to it, so you can actually uh, point to a, a rootFS torrent and retrieve it that way, which is really useful for um, when you boot a lot of servers at once. And then there's many tunable options that can be set via the kernel command line just to kind of control how it boots and how, how the behavior works. Uh, and you can find more information at their, their wiki. So why use a live OS? Um, everything boots from a single image. You can make, you can make changes without a reboot, but, um, uh, but you should update the image. Um, security, can, security updates can be rolled out to a live OS to avoid a reboot. Um, but you can also add it to the next reboot, so, so the next image will get it. Um, and you can update to a new release of the OS and roll back to the existing one if you need to. Um, it's portable and easy to test and develop on. Uh, you know exactly what's in the build. Uh, everything is uh, version tracked. You can tag tickets to it. Uh, if you're from Jira, you can mark all that. So you, if you add a, a feature or something, you know who added it, you know what it was for. Uh, and memory is cheap. You know, it was costly in the past. Uh, back in the day, there were 16, 32 gig boxes. Uh, nowadays, everything's 128, 256 and up. So it's really cheap just to run the, the file system in memory. So let's talk a little bit about how the, uh, the image process, the image build process works. So we put together a tool uh, internally at Rackspace called Squashable. Um, it's kind of a combination of SquashFS and Ansible. Um, and it's just a bunch of Ansible playbooks that automate the build process of creating the images. Uh, and it supports multiple versions. Uh, I think right now it supports CentOS, Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, and Ubuntu. Um, but you can actually add additional OS support to it uh, as long as uh, they have Dracut or another way to live boot. Um, when we started down this project, we originally started with Debian Live. And um, it worked really well. Um, the problem was, it, I think Ubuntu tried to use Casper and then Fedora was using Dracut. So there was just a lot of you know, different distributions using different things. So we wanted to try to find a, try to find a way to unify that. So we started using Dracut. Um, and for right now, it seems like most of the operating systems have a way to use that to, to kind of create a live OS image. Um, so the, the one we have internally, we kind of have been pulling bits out of it and trying to make it really generic, try to support like a lot more operating systems. And that's the one we put on GitHub, and I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, but really, the bulk of our configuration management is really done during the image build time. So like any kind of packages we want, any kind of optimizations and customizations, uh, we can do at that point. And then um, once the, the image is online and running, then you can deploy the configurations to it. 
um, and that's where it'll persist on that store. So if you reboot the image, uh, it'll still pull the configs that you deployed to it. Um, so all changes to the build, like I said, live within the repo. Um, they're fully tracked, very reproducible. So you can really just kind of spit out an image of the latest build, or you can go back to a previous image that maybe you're running production and try to reproduce that. So let's kind of just walk through the, the image process. Um, so we start out with an initial bootstrap. Um, so we use Docker to kind of um, to kind of make sure we don't have to use multiple build servers for each one of the OSs. So we kind of use that to abstract the, the OS we're building in. Uh, and we use, we, use, we use it to create a minimal truth. So the minimal truth uh, initially consists of a package manager and an init system. Um, and really it's just enough packages to, to run Ansible within a truth. Um, once, once we're done with that, um, we tear down the, the container. Uh, we copy the, the tarball to the Jenkins server. Uh, and then we go into the next step. So we, the next one is we, we prepare the truth. Um, so we use the Ansible truth module to kind of catch up the OS. Uh, we throw some version tracking metadata, so it's basically some information from the build server. Uh, we, we throw any kind of package manager configurations, so like where to go pull your packages from, uh, any kind of pinning we might need. Uh, we throw that in there, and then we kind of update all the packages at that point in that stage. And then the next stage is like the common configuration. So really, this is just a, a bunch of different settings or packages you might have within your company where you might want to have one image that you can, everybody can log into. Um, it's really just all the, the stuff you have within your company, like your logging practices, your auditing practices, security, auth, all that stuff. You, you'd want everything in this common uh, playbook. Next, you'd have the, uh, the personality you'd want to apply. Um, and that could be a KVM hypervisor, Zen hypervisor, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever kind of makes it different from the, the common configuration or from other images. Uh, and, and there you'd have all of your performance optimizations, maybe libvert configs, um, and just different things in there to make that the actual image that you want to, to boot. So at this point, uh, the image is done. Uh, so you'd, you'd copy the, the kernel and the init RAMFS that were in that truth out to the deployment server. Uh, you would tarball the, the file system that you generated uh, and copy that to the deployment server too. Um, and then in our case, we use um, mktorrent to generate the torrent file of that uh, tarball. And then we have our deployment server start a, uh, start a torrent using rtorrent to create that initial seed. Uh, so then as servers come online from the deployment server, uh, the first thing they'll do is go retrieve the, the kernel, the init ramfs, and then they'll go hit the, the rootfs torrent and retrieve that. Uh, and as the more servers kind of come online, the more servers start seeding that torrent. Uh, so you actually add more to the swarm. Uh, and it's really just a quick retrieval of the torrent initially, and then it, it drops the, stops seeding it. Um, but once your OS is booted, you can actually fire up another seed again, uh, just to kind of continue on that seed to kind of speed up the whole process. So let's, let's touch really briefly on the boot process and kind of what it looks like. So we build an image. Um, now what are we going to do? Well, let's, let's try and boot it. Um, you, can use, um, you can use iPixie or Pixie links to kind of boot it over the network. Uh, you can also use it, you can also boot it from the local disk using Grub or ext Linux. Um, and you can also, um, you can actually boot into the image from a running server using kexec. Um, it's very easy to fall back to the last booted images too if uh, your network boot has somehow failed. Um, if you have your boot order in your BIOS set to network boot and then local boot, uh, it can actually go to the local boot, hit grub, and then go talk to, to the last known image you pulled uh, previously. Uh, it's just a matter of just scripting that out and just kind of uh, making sure it's pointing to that. Um, there's, of course, lots of open source provisioning systems out there, so I'm not gonna really go into too many of that. Um, there's a lot more homegrown ones. Um, I'll, I'll touch on our homegrown one in a second. But this is basically the, um, the iPixie config you'd have. Um, you're, you're basically setting up some Draca commands uh, that basically go on the kernel command line, uh, retrieves the kernel, retrieves the initRD, uh, and then it, uh, you can set it to pull from HTTP or torrent or, or whatever. This is some of the, the booting from ext Linux. Um, what, like I said, what we're doing is we create a, a, a boot cache. So once it retrieves that image the first time, it caches that on a, the first partition of the disk. Uh, and so then we would also generate the grub config. So if the server does have to reboot and local boot, uh, it can pull that last known image and at least get the server back up and running. Um, that kind of helps out with the case of like a boot storm where you lost power, everything's trying to boot up. 
uh, you at least want to get everything back up and running without you know, having to worry about things pulling the network. And you can also roll out images ahead of time and just skip the network boot entirely if you wanted to. Uh, and then you can boot from kexec, which is really useful if you're trying to iterate on the image and try and see how it works. Um, and the, bi the big trick to kind of make sure you, you kind of work on is to make sure your hardware drivers work with kexec. There's, there's some issues with some drivers where if you kexec, it'll just hang because it doesn't release the driver properly. So it's just one thing to kind of watch out for. So our primary boot method that we use at Rackspace is called Terraform. Um, in a nutshell, it, it makes a DHCP request and retrieves an IPixie kernel. Uh, it identifies itself uh, using LDP, so it listens on the, the network for uh, packets. LDP is the, the link layer discovery protocol, if you don't know. Um, so it listens for packets from the switch that uh, say what switch name and what switch port that the server is connected to. Um, so we use that information to go look up um, where that server is in the data center from our inventory management system, uh, and we call it that. We call that inventory management system Galaxy. Um, but once it goes and finds its server number and all of its attributes, it pulls that down and it throws those into an IPixie template. And from there, uh, it, it looks and sees what its boot status is, what boot operating system, system it's supposed to run. Uh, and if it's a new deployment, uh, we'll typically um, run it through the a utility disk that we have. It's just a utility live OS. Uh, and it'll catch the firmware and BIOS settings up to date. Uh, it'll configure the storage if there's RAID. Um, let's configure OBM, the out of band management. Um, it'll capture all the inventory and it'll push that to Galaxy. Uh, and then it'll load KXEC into the, the hypervisor OS or at that point start the, the install of our, our older uh, builds. So, some initial scale tests. Um, we tested with about 200 servers on x86, uh, running Fedora 23 based live OS. Um, the time to build the whole package and run it through the, the Jenkins system was about 10 minutes. So it's relatively quick. Um, it's about 60 seconds to boot once uh, post completes. And then um, from reprovisioning servers that are already in a cluster to rebooting them, wiping the disks, um, and kind of uh, you know, redeploying the, the code to it and all that, it's about 15 minutes. So I mean, you can, you know, 15 minutes, you can wipe an entire cluster of 200 servers and be back up and running provisioning instances. So it's really quick. I mean, you could probably scale this up to a lot more servers. Um, and because of you have Torrent in place, it really kind of speeds up things and lets things network boot quick. Um, currently, right now, we're testing on Open Power, um, codenamed Barrelai. It, it's basically a, a Power 8 build that we've been working on with, uh, with IBM on. Um, we're, we're testing OpenStack KVM with it. Um, with Fedora 23, and it, it's been working really well. Um, you know, we're still hammering out a lot of hardware issues with the, the, the unit, but uh, we're making good progress. Uh, and if you want to find out more about Barrelai, there's a lot of information on the, the blog of Rackspace. Uh, we recently announced an uh, initiative with uh, Google to kind of work on the next Power 9 platform, so I think we'll have some good stuff coming from that. Uh, future ideas. Um, I'd like to see some embedded configuration management inside the image and just see how that works. Um, essentially, I want everything to kind of live in the image where you know, the image comes up and knows where to go pull playbooks from to kind of automate that configuration, um, where to go pull its inventory information from. So really, you could just reboot the, the instance, any, the, reboot the, the server at any point, and it would just go rebuild itself automatically. Um, I think that would be pretty useful, because um, then if you can get to that point, you can kind of start maybe getting rid of disks and getting rid of another failure point that you might have in your, your system. Um, the other thing, too, is you might be able to do stateless instances. Um, if it works for hypervisors and bare metal, it, it works great with just regular instances. Um, we could potentially do boot from config drive, where you kind of network boot from uh, your config drive you already have. Um, you may be using syslinux or isolinux, since config drive is already in iso. Um, so that might be a possibility. Um, and you, so, I mean, if you had like 100 web servers, you could essentially just reboot them all and bring up the latest build um, without having to have a disk. I mean, you'd, you, could, you could probably find some other place to store your data. Um, I mean, if you have a web head, you could have that, you know, persistent. But, you know, for the web heads, I mean, they're usually just throw away for the most part, and they usually look the same. So there's a lot of things you can do with that. Um, and I actually even tested this on, uh, on Metal, our on Metal product. Um, which is running ironic, and um, it, it worked great. I mean, I just modified the Grub bootloader, rebooted into Live OS, and it, and it just worked. So, 
So, I mean, if you want to go check it out, uh, you can give it a try. Um, I, I got the, the website up last night. It's squashable.com. It's also on my GitHub. Um, so you can kind of kick that around and, you know, give me some feedback. Uh, if it sounds cool, if it sounds crazy, um, you know, let me know. Um, I, I think it's, it's a really useful tool for just a large scale environment where you have lots and lots of the same kind of appliances, uh, so to speak. Um, so it works pretty well. Um, and then I have sample boot menus. So I'm using Travis CI to kind of generate uh, images for each one of the ones that we support. So they may or may not work, uh, but you can use the, the iPixie boot menu to kind of boot into those, and then you can just boot the live OS and log into it and just kind of kick it around. So that is pretty much it. Um, make sure to check out the Rackspace Cantina. Uh, they have refreshments and drinks and stuff. And thank you very much for coming. Um, if there's any questions, I think there's mics, so. Hey, good morning, Anthony. Yeah, first What's of all, on? thank you. Brilliant presentation. Thank you. Wanted to kind of take it a little different angle and kind of get your thoughts on what Rackspace is seeing. So looking into the industry, we're seeing things like HP Moonshot going after like complete <coughs> ARM infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And also seeing things like DigitalOcean providing ARM as a new platform. Is there any thought about Rackspace looking at ARM, whether it be in a consolidated environment or ultimately even kind of a scale out? I know, I know we're always looking at multiple technologies. I think right now um, one of our main focuses is, is just on open power. Okay. Just because we, we see a lot of good stuff there. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the BMCs are open. Um, sure. Everything is just on GitHub, so you can actually contribute to, toward a lot of that. Okay. Uh, a lot of stuff in the past has typically been kind of closed source, so it's, it's really hard to kind of contribute yeah. to it. ARM architecture within itself can also lead to that. So I definitely see where you guys are looking at how you can have kind of that multiplier effect by being open. I guess yeah. the other half that I look for is, you know, like everybody's carrying one around, mm -hmm. so trying to play that forward, not only in the consolidated racks like the HPs or the digital oceans, but trying to think of where is Rackspace looking even that further? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking there. Um, you know, the funny thing is, like, we run, we run Zen primarily today. Sure. So, you know, they have Zen on ARM support, but they don't have Zen on power. So we're actually having to look at KVM for that piece. So it's... Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's... Okay. Brilliant. Thank you A lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Hi there. So uh, what's the memory footprint on the server once you've uh, booted the live OS. Yeah, I mean, so you can set up um, the size of the root FS. So I've been like setting it up as like two to three gig or so. Um, it, I think it actually takes about four gigs to eight gigs, depending on uh, what's being loaded up. But it's actually pretty small. Uh, it depends on what you're putting in there. Um, so like for just a base OS, KVM, Libvirt, and an OpenStack virtual environment, I'm getting about a 500, 500 gig compressed uh, file. So it's not really that big. 500 gig, 500 meg. Or 500 meg, sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's really small. Yeah. And uh, how much are you using any of this in production, and if so, how much? I'm not, we're not using it in production yet. Uh, it's mainly just R&D. Um, really, wh what it comes down to is that we run Zen Server primarily today. So we haven't, we've looked at doing this on Zen Server. Uh, we have some examples on that uh, GitHub repo as well. Um, but, you know, obviously it wouldn't be supported. And um, the current versions are CentOS 5 which don't really have a lot of good support for systemd and DRACA and all that. Yeah. Um, their next version is supposed to be CentOS 7, which has all that support in there, so I think we could probably do a lot more work with it. Um, and then we'll probably be able to start looking at doing production. All right, thanks. No problem. Hey, um, do you have any uh, guest testing after you reboot a hypervisor to see if guest instances have any issues with a newly booted uh, you know, any, oh, a new KVM came up and now Windows doesn't work or something? Yeah, so we did scale testing on, on this 200 node cluster. We did a um, test of, we spun up about 8,000 VMs, uh, ran and burn in and all that. You know, just power cycled the cluster, started it back up again, let Libvirt start everything up. Burn in started fine again. Um, you know, we didn't really try to do mass upgrades of like going from multiple versions of Libvirt and all that. Um, but that's something we could probably test in CI. Um, I'm sure we could probably just, you know, if we have a new version, make sure everything's solid on that, the same kind of virtual machines work, and uh, we'd probably be okay. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? What kind of demand do you, pers uh, do you see with uh, 
with power. Um, I mean, it's a cool platform, but like, is there really enough demand to kind of qualify your R and D on it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like there's a lot of applications I can take advantage of how many threads it has and uh, just how the performance is on it. So we we kind of see uh, it being a really good place to kind of start digging into and. And looking at, and really, we, we, we really like the open platform. We, li we like OpenStack. We like just being able to contribute, you know, to our hardware as well. Uh, for a lot of years, we've had to kind of, you know, work with Dell and HP. And if we have an issue, we are kind of at their mercy. So we kind of want to take things under our reign. Uh, and I, we thought Open Power was a really good place to kind of start with. Anything else? All right, well, thank you.